Welcome to the inaugural edition of Problem Solving in Turbulence. Uh, my name is Timothy Clancy. I'm the founder and president of Dialectic Simulations Consulting. And what I'd like to do is obviously um, with everything that's going on with COVID and economic problems and businesses changing and configurating, I wanted to, you know, those of you who have seen me over in the info mullet, I provide context to the news, sort of more current events, but I wanted a episode that was a little more focused on organizational problems, ones that businesses, profit and nonprofit, government agencies, schools, churches, universities, you know, problems that organizations are facing in this environment and talk about how we might use structured systems thinking as problem solving tools in that environment. Now, a little background on myself. I have nearly 30 years in problem solving. Um, I've been a consultant for much of that time. I've worked for IBM. I've worked for the Department of Defense. I've worked for a host of government agencies. I'm also a system scientist. So I research and study complex systems and how we operate in complex systems. And so I've built a tool set uh, combining a lot of the problem solving skills I've gained over the years, but also a, a healthy dose of system science. So what these series are going to do is, is sort of introduce some of the concepts of structured systems thinking, which is a, a way we use to understand complex systems and apply them to practical business problems, try and get it out of the realm of academics and in the realm of uh, the problems that people are experiencing. Now, earlier in the week, I, I queried uh, my Facebook group and some of my colleagues of what were some of the common problems they were facing. And we're going to touch on some of those today, but I've also got um, a list of future topics. And so in the comments, if you see a future topic you like, just go ahead and click and link in that. Um, also, all of these videos are going to be, uh, they're currently on Facebook because I'm, you know, broadcasting them live. But don't worry if you can't make it schedule wise, we'll put them up on the YouTube channel. And if you look in the links for this, there's the YouTube channel, but we'll also take segments of this and share it on LinkedIn. So there'll be a couple ways to see it. So don't worry if you're not able to get to it on a Thursday afternoon. But what I wanted to get started with is this concept of, you know, we talk about problem solving and turbulence. Well, the first question people are going to ask is, what is turbulence? And I'm talking not just like air turbulence or turbulence in a, in a physical way, but system turbulence. So uh, if you think about complex systems as being sort of like, a, um, you know, you're, you're navigating a ship along the ocean. Think of this old frigate, wooden sails, right? The ocean can have fast currents, it can have slow currents, and you navigate around those, but they're fairly steady curvements. The, the wind may increase or not, but turbulence in this metaphor of a ship on the ocean is when a storm comes in and those waves begin really roiling. And you've seen them, we've all seen it in Hollywood, maybe we've experienced it. That's what we would call one dimensional turbulence. And that's a physical kind of turbulence. If you're flying in an airplane, pockets of air that um, can cause the plane to jerk around, come up, these are turbulence in systems. But these are simple physical systems and it's usually one dimensional turbulence. So if you're a captain on one of these old wooden ships with sails, you have a crew, you have a boat, and the water, the, 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 the ocean you're going across turns into this roiling mass of waves. Well, you try and navigate your boat through that turbulence. Um, you don't really care what's going on at the bottom of the seafloor. You're, you're, you know the capabilities of your ship. It's not going to change on you. You know your crew. You've hopefully trained them well. So you're managing one-dimensional turbulence. In complex systems, though, we're not bound by physical limitations the way we are in a physical system. So turbulence can become multidimensional turbulence. And I think what's going on now in the world is a really good example of the challenges of multidimensional turbulence. It's, it's, it's kind of like you're navigating that boat through the ocean, and not only is the storm roiling the waves and chopping it, but your boat's changing as well. You may have gone from a, you know, a, a sleek frigate doing pirate hunting to a cargo ship. Your boat physically changes in a reaction because there's now a connection in complex systems between the world around you and the structure you're occupying and dealing with. So a second dimension of turbulence, maybe your organization begins reacting to the turbulence around it by shifting and changing. A third dimension of turbulence might be the people. You know, we live in a pandemic world where people have needs and demands being placed on them, concerns and fears that are coming from outside the organization. So that's a third dimension of turbulence, right? Again, the physical turbulence of an airplane flying through a storm clouds or a boat on the seas, that's one dimensional turbulence. And you, it's not easy, but you can navigate that because everything else is staying the same. In a complex system, when we talk about multidimensional turbulence, these interacting turbulences begin to feed off one another in, in creating feedback effects that complicates 
the reaction and problem solving to them. And we can keep going on. There's many more kinds of turbulence. There's governmental turbulence. Are, are, is, your, is your community going to be open or closed next week? Or what phase are you in? Um, all these economic turbulence, are we in a situation where your supply chains are open or closed? All of these dimensions of turbulence have to be navigated and managed at the same time, which is what the definition of a really complex system is, and it's kind of what we're all living with um, right now. And so I, 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 the way we look at this, the way you can think of this, the reason we, I use structured systems thinking is because it's kind of a way of understanding all of these relationships as it's happening. Now, there's a formal science called system dynamics that we use computational uh, simulations and lots of math. Structured system thinking is kind of the heuristic version of that. It's a decision-making skill. It's something you can use without data, uh, without a lot of technology, but it's designed to help you see the relationship between these different interacting parts. They describe it as not seeing the forest or the trees, but seeing the forest and the trees understanding the role of all of these individual parts that they play individually, but then using tools to understand how they come together. And the, the use of structured systems thing is it's designed for people who aren't scientists to have a, a decision-making skill that they can help, you know, make current decisions now, but also avoid, avoid future problems and sort of improve the performance while in turbulent systems. Um, it doesn't rely on technology at all. But one of the questions I had when I put this out as a preview is someone was asking, what is the difference between turbulence and chaos? And chaos, you'll hear the phrase, the butterfly flaps its rings in India and a, and a hurricane or a tornado starts somewhere else. That's um, speaking to how small uh, permutations and in initial conditions, the butterfly, very small animal, can create seemingly unpredictable consequences way down the line. But another version of chaos is true randomness, where there's no causal connection or relationship between the things that are happening. And it can feel like we're in chaos right now. 2020 certainly feels like we're in chaos, but if you poke underneath the hood and you begin looking at the systems, you see that all of these things are interconnected to one another. They are all reacting to one another. Nothing is really random. It may be hard to see how it's connected or why it's connected, but that's why we use systems thinking tools and problem solving to understand those connections. So the difference between turbulence and chaos is turbulence is a system that is no longer predictable. It's no longer steady. It's no longer... Um, and, and remember, we can be in a fast-moving ocean current that's still steady. That's not turbulence. That's, that's a challenge, but it's not turbulence. Turbulence is where it... Um, all of these changes are occurring rapidly, but they're caused by something. Chaos is completely random, unrelated things. So we need to distinguish between turbulence and chaos and focus on how we manage in turbulence. Now, when I do problem solving with clients, um, and, and by the way, feel free to ask questions throughout this. Again, if you watch this later, drop a question in the comments. Uh, it'll help me if I don't get it to it this time, I can get to it on a future episode. But, um, when we talk about problem solving, there's two things you need to do in turbulent environments very, very quickly. And that, and I'm going to go over one this week and one next week or the next time I do it. But the first one is to understand the color of the problem you're dealing with. And there's four kinds of colors. And I've used this for years to help clients get a grasp. John, remember, before you solve a problem, you need to know what the problem is. And the color of the problem gives you an indication of sort of psychologically, how do you need to prepare for it, what it's going to mean, what some of the challenges are. And we use these colors to simply classify four kinds of problems based on their color type. So um, the first color are the green problems. These are obstacles. These are simple barriers. Uh, it's, it, the solutions are obvious, right? You come up to a green obstacle, you, 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 it, it's, a, it's a wall. You need to get over the wall, use a ladder, you walk around it, you break through it. But once you're past an obstacle, it's in your past, right? It's in your rearview mirror. Um, those are fairly easy, but we call them green problems. They're obstacles. Yellow problems, these are what we call dilemmas. A, a dilemma, you know, the, the benefit of a green problem is the solution is obvious and low cost. A dilemma may have obvious solutions, but none of them are easy or obviously um, cost-free. In fact, one of the characteristics of a dilemma kind of problem is that the choices all have consequences and there's no 
obviously right option. So it, it, often in a dilemma, we're picking between least worst options. And so you can see how all of a sudden from green problems, which are fairly easy, basic obstacles, we've jumped to a high degree of complexity because dilemmas, they may be hard to implement, they may be hard to reverse or unreversible, um, they may have consequences with them, but at least we know what these solutions are and we have information. So th there's a psychological barrier here of not wanting to make a, a choice that's gonna have a consequence, but at least you know what your options are. Uh, a red problem, these we call quandaries, and quandaries are typified by high degrees of ambiguity, uncertainty. See, in a, in a dilemma, we know the cost-benefit analysis, we know the pros and cons, it's, it's, we're, we're struggling between picking the least worst option, but we know what our options are. In a quandary, we don't know what the options are. We may not know what the consequences are. We may not even know what the problem itself is on a good detailed level. Uh, you know, we may have a sense that there's a problem. We may feel that there's something going wrong, but we may not have the full data. So quandaries are uh, examples of um, where the solutions aren't as obvious and you're dealing with a lot of uncertainty. And the worst kind of problems to have are predicaments. So if a quandary is information you don't have on a problem you're gonna to have to make a decision about in the future, a predicament is when a quandary comes home. Right, a quandary is not time bound. You have some time to deal with it. A predicament is when you're dealing with the decision you have to make right now, but you are still in this high degree of ambiguity, uncertainty. Um, and this is a, uh, the, the, the predicaments are some of the most challenging problems because you, you're still in this high ambiguity, but you gotta make decisions right now. So how do you, um, you know, as a leader, if you're a leader or a problem solver, how do you go through these psychologically, right? I advise folks, if you're a leader, don't micromanage your greens, right? Delegate your green problems out to your problem solvers, hand them out, get them off your plate, and um, you know, go into your problem solving toolbox, whatever you need. Again, the solutions are fairly obvious and the costs are low, so solve your green problems quickly. You need to clear the decks for the yellow, red, and purple problems. If you're a leader and you're dealing with green problems, you're probably too far in the weeds and not having enough perspective, nor are you trusting your teams enough to sort of solve your green problems. Um, when it comes to dilemmas, your, your, your yellow problems, uh, the, the reality, the, the psychological reason we put these off is we sort of recognize that no matter what choice we make, there may be, it may be unpopular, it may not work, so there may be a risk that we're, our reputation's at stake, and so part of the psychological effort of dilemmas is to recognize and be upfront that these are gonna be hard choices. You wanna engage your stakeholders throughout the organization or community. You wanna educate and build consensus to what the problem is and a shared commitment to the solution. So those soft skills that are in our problem solving toolbox really come effective for dilemmas. Yes, there's a lot of technical ways to sort of evaluate the pros and cons, but the biggest thing with dilemmas is communicating the, the reality of the challenge of it and the potential consequences so that it's a shared decision or a shared accountability rather than one person feeling like it's all on them. Um, when it comes to quandaries, you need to get ahead of these, right? A quandary is when an ambiguity is present and you've got some time to deal with it. So I, I say attack your red problems, right? While you're, you're delegating your greens to clear your deck, hopefully, uh, and you're sort of building consensus around your dilemmas, spend your energy attacking your red problems because you have some time. Go to those analytical tools, go to those toolbox, and we'll talk about ones throughout these courses, what some of those tools are. But the whole point of a, of a, of a quandary is to clarify your options. Get rid of that ambiguity as much as you can. Do the analysis, do the work. You might shift it from a quandary back to a dilemma. You might even shift it from a quandary to an obstacle. If you can figure out, get rid of that ambiguity and certainty, that's a good place to be. Um, and of course, predicaments are the worst because you've run out of time. You've run out of the ability to do this sort of analysis of the quandary. And this is where you can really create turbulence in a team um, because everyone tends to sense when a predicament hits. It's not really a confusion. You know, leaders tend to hold things back and sort of be reluctant to share, but teams get a feeling of when a predicament is. Um, and, you know, your behaviors while you're in a predicament, be calm, be professional, um, stick to your guns, be thorough, be respectful. But when you decide, commit to it. It's kind of like a predicament is like you're in a swamp and suddenly you find out there are toxic fumes in the center, right? 
you've got to rally your team quickly and get moving to find a way out. And that means no matter which pit path you pick, if you keep reversing course, you're going to keep going back to the center and you're guaranteed to get stuck in the middle. So think about predicaments as you don't have time for paralysis analysis anymore. That time is passed in your quandaries. You need to make the best informed decision you can quickly and, and then commit to it until, you, until it's obvious it's the wrong one. But I mean, the worst thing with a predicament is when people get spun around like a top and kind of go back and forth on these, these options and they just end up circling around the center gravity of the problem. And then, then you're losing more time. So again, your green obstacles, delegate them, get them out of the way. Um, your, your, your yellow problems, uh, communicate with your stakeholders. I'll make sure people understand the problems and the choices, your red problems, your quandaries, use your analysis to try and remove that ambiguity in your predicaments, pick a path and stay through it. Now, um, by the way, if there's any questions on this, feel free to ask, but I did have a question um, leading into this, which is how has COVID-19 affected these problem types? And it's, it's interesting because COVID-19, of course, is the cause of this turbulence and it's, it's, it's dramatically changed the problem landscape. I've done this, what color is your problem for years? <laughs> and first of all, COVID-19 throws up a host of obstacle problems, right? How do you wear a mask? Where do you get your PPE? Um, how do you reconfigure for space and social distancing? Um, how do you uh, 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 allocate your... Re there's, there's a lot of green problems in COVID. So as a leader, first thing you need to do is expand your problem-solving team and get folks working on those obstacle problems. Don't try and solve them on itself. The, the dilemma of COVID-19 is that you're constantly dealing with this, these, these tensions between safety and performance. And those can be not always obvious as to, I mean, as leaders, we're used to these kind of X and performance, morale and performance, cost and performance. Now we've got safety thrown in. And safety is something that's much harder to compromise on and maintain any integrity as a leader. So as a dilemma, COVID-19 dilemmas are particularly apt because you're not just asking for extra hours at work or extra focus. People have relatives, they have communities, they have children, they have stakeholders and friends who, who may be at greater risk. Anytime you're asking someone to take a risk of COVID, you're asking them to take a communal risk on behalf of their entire network. And that means it's a lot harder dilemma. Um, quandaries, the interesting thing about quandaries in COVID is a lot of lingering quandaries that we're focusing to companies disappeared overnight from COVID. You know, everyone's like, well, you know, we're, we're not really sure what the benefits of work from home are. So we'll put that off. We'll do some more analysis. We're uncertain about um, <laughs> the downside of COVID is it shifted all of those quandaries to predicaments. And that was one of the things that was interesting to watch throughout March as quandaries became predicaments overnight. The, the problems that you put off solving and resolving got escalated into predicaments and you no longer had time. And at that point, some of them reverted to obstacles and they're like, we're just moving everyone online. I, I talked about how in many companies there would come a Monday when they just said, everyone goes online. It doesn't matter what it is, just do it. Um, oh, Jennifer, good comment. Yes, yeah, so, so much sense in regards to software development leadership. I'm interested in if you have, Jennifer, any, any e examples to share of sort of green, yellow, red, purple um, problems. But yeah, COVID shifted the whole problem landscape and made it a lot more complex, but you can still use these to think about it. It's, you know, your, your, your quandaries became predicaments. So yeah, your, your reds became purples and a lot new green showed up and you, a lot of them, then you have these dilemmas, but it doesn't mean that the method of how you approach these problems changed. Um, so any other questions on colors of problems? Um, before I continue on, because there's there's one kind of particular problem that has come up a lot, and we'll use these terms as I look at other problems. So when I when I asked on Facebook for the kinds of problems, I look at these problems and I say that's a green problem, or that's a red problem, or that's a purple problem. So we'll use these types in future episodes, which is why I wanted to go through today and kind of describe what they are. But we'll use them, and the the next week or the next time I do this, we'll go over the type of problem, which is how. Uh, complex a problem it is because your color is about psychological and reactions your type is about um, behavioral and dynamic complexity so with that we'll jump into the next one which is the accidental adversary so one of the um, 
in systems thinking, we use system patterns or system archetypes. These are almost like, you can think of it, a system pattern being like a football play. If you're an experienced or a soccer play or a basketball play, any sort of sports, if you are familiar with the formation the other team is taking and you kind of get it, you see what they're, they're, they come up to the line. Let's use football because I'm more familiar. You see the football team come up. They've got a shotgun formation. They got receivers out. You kind of get a sense, not exactly what's about to happen, but you get a feeling of the range of possibilities based on the pattern that they take the field with. This is what system archetypes are. System archetypes are blueprints of common complex system dynamics that we can use to understand not exactly what's going to happen with precision, but what possibly might happen. And just like in football, if you see, if you're the quarterback now and you see the defense lining up for a blitz, you can make audible calls. You can change the play. You can make adjustments. The point of system patterns and the reason we use them in decision making is so that people can recognize what kind of complex system dynamic they're in and then once you see you're in it, you can understand how to navigate out of it. And this becomes really important in these turbulent times because remember, we're on a ship on the ocean where the waves are roiling, the ship is changing in our feet, the crew is changing as we move, everything's changing simultaneously. So we need to quickly see what system patterns we're in and understand what the future might become with these system patterns because that's how we, again, shift our problems from uh, predicaments to quandaries to dilemmas to obstacles and begin solving them. So. I wanted to go through one of the more common ones, uh, and I'm sure I'll bring it up again. It's called accidental adversaries, and this is a very common system pattern, and I'm going to lay it out here on using a, a piece of software I use. But in, in structured systems thinking, we, we display these system patterns in feedback loops. That is the unit of measure and uh, description that we use. And in future ones, I might go through all these symbols, but... Um, it's, very, it's fairly easy to read if you think about it. It's got the terms are the types of things that are going on in the system, and the arrows show the causal connection. Remember, it's basically manager's confidence in meeting objectives. You follow the arrow. That leads to collaboration with teams. These symbols on the arrow tell you logically as one thing increases, what happens to the next thing in the causal chain. Um, so, And a, a positive sign means that it moves in the same direction. So if uh, manager's confidence in meeting increases, collaboration with teams increases. If manager's confidence in meetings decreases, collaboration with teams decreases. It's a little confusing at times because people are like, well, it went down. But think of positive as same, same, right? What happened in the antecedent or the previous one will be the same dynamic in the later one. And we assemble these feedback loops to show how relationships feedback on themselves. This is the part, the nonlinear part that's missing from, if you've done process improvement, I've done a ton of lean, a ton of Six Sigma, a ton of agile, they don't make these feedback loops explicit. And that's the part that's missing for a complex system. So we talk about structured systems thinking as being the tools for everything not covered by the process mapping. So um, this feedback loop is the, um, what I would call the virtuous feedback loop of accidental adversaries. It's what we want to have happen. And it begins with, um, you know, this is when you take a team and you're, you're putting them remote, you got to move your workforce to remote work and you haven't done it before. So managers have this need to be confident in meeting their objective. If they're confident, they'll collaborate more with their teams. The collaboration will reinforce team confidence in management. So the team will be supportive in innovating remote management tools, methods, it's different ways of doing work. So, and as we innovate more in remote manager meetings and, or excuse me, remote work. Uh, the managers get more confidence in meeting their things. This is a positive feedback loop. As long as one of them's going up, they're all going up. And we call this a virtuous loop. Uh, it, and we, this is the aspirational behavior. This is what we want, right? No one's, now this isn't shocking to anyone. This isn't surprising. The whole point of a system pattern is its component parts are fairly self-explanatory. It's when you begin combining them that the complexity emerges. So this is what everyone wants, the virtuous relationship of managers who are confident, working with their um, employees to develop innovative ways to work from home and work remote, happy days. Well, of course, things happen, right? So the first thing that happens is business demands from the pandemic, right? <laughs> you know, there's a pandemic on or our business is collapsing. This introduces stress to managers. And so this little negative sign means as the previous one increases, the next one goes and the decreases. Think of negative as opposites, right? So as business demands increase, managers' confidence in meeting objectives decrease. It's opposite. 
And as managers' confidence in meeting objectives decrease, their desire for control increases. Again, it's a negative sign. And as their desire for control increases, their confidence and they implement things to create control, their confidence increases. Again, this is simplistic. This isn't going to capture all managers, but we're looking now at a system dynamic that's broadly speaking across a manager. And I put this in red because this is creating what's called the vicious pattern. So the virtuous pattern is the green outside. But we've now had a pressure introduced on the business demands that creates this internal dynamic that's vicious. And as the desire for control comes up, what managers begin doing is violating what are, I call work from home norms, right? There's certain things that make work from home great that if your manager's constantly checking in on you, assigning lots of busy work just to make sure that you're busy, they can't see you so they don't, they don't know what you're doing. That's the reality of work from home. And if you've come to, I mean, I've worked from home for 15 years when I wasn't on a client site. These things sort of fade in the background. But when you're a new manager, that lack of visible control leads you to do things that violate the kind of benefits from work from homes that, that make it effective. And as you violate the work from home norms, you reduce the team confidence in management, right? So again, it's a negative sign. So as desire for control goes up, positive sign, the violation of work from home norms goes up. As the violation of work from home norms goes up, the team confidence declines. So think about, because remember, these outer loops are still going on. As team confidence declines, it's a positive sign, so same, same. As team confidence declines, their willingness to innovate declines. As managers' confidence in meeting objective declines, their collaboration with teams declines. So even as this vicious behavior emerges in the center, it's weakening the virtuous loop on the outside of the dynamic. And of course, when team confidence in the management declines, they react by wanting to retain those benefits of working from home, the feeling of independence, the feeling of teamwork, the feeling of being able to set your own schedule and have a little bit of flexibility. And let's be clear, there's external demands on the team members as well, because it's a pandemic for them as well. They've got relatives, they've got um, children, they've got worries about school, they've got existential feelings of dread that 2020 is the Mayan apocalypse we all thought was coming in 2012, delayed by, I mean, it's, it's a pandemic, right? It's a very tense time. And if we don't account for that, you know, managers are thinking, well, I'm just trying to meet the business objectives, but your team's also living with the external demands of what's causing pressure from them. And so the reaction to this creates this next part of the vicious feedback loop where they desire to retain their benefits from work from home and they begin violating the control measures, right? Um, and, and these violations aren't necessarily twist the mustache, conspiracy, we're gonna sabotage. They could be inadvertent, they could be unintentional, they could be unconscious. Um, but what happens is you've now created an internal vicious feedback loop where you have this violation of norming behavior that's going on between managers who are motivated to uh, feel more confident that they're going to meet objectives. So they're, they're implementing procedures and processes and steps. And it, the team reaction is reacting to that. Again, they may not realize it, but they're reacting to it by sort of violating the control measures, which decreases the manager's confidence. And what happens is... Um, you get this kind of feedback loop on the inside that's a vicious feedback loop. And as this feedback loop strengthens, it's always leaking, weakening the external. So this combined dynamic is called the axonal adversaries. And it's actually going on at all times. There's no time that, that it's perfect and no one is violating norms. But the way you can think about this from a structured systems thinking way is which loop is dominant? Which loop is currently in control of the system? Are we stronger in the outside one where our confidence and collaboration and innovation are, are keeping us doing well and practicing that virtuous partnership loop? Or are we violating each other's norms and kind of like getting snippy at each other and sort of reluctant to engage and like, please put that in an email or as per my previous email, you know, that kind of behavior. Part of structured systems thinking it, that a lot of the, the secret sauce is recognizing a system when you're in it. And that's hard because you're, you're in that ship on the ocean with everything changing to pause and say, wait a minute, is this storm an accidental adversary storm? Because just as this explains the problem, it also gives us an insight in how to begin solving it. Think about this. We know that as team collaboration increases, team confidence increases, and as innovation and remote management and works and practices and tools increase, managers' confidence increases. 
So the more we can reinforce this external loop, the more it will damp the internal set of loops. And you can do this through a variety of ways. We do an entire series on collaboration using systems thinking to help people understand, you know, stand up, you know, you have um, not just meetings for meeting sakes, but collaboration where you reassert why you're in this together, right? We're all working for the same company. We all want the same goal, but, and we all live in the same pandemic. So part of the effort of shifting to this external loop is reinforcing the reasons why you're working together in the first place. This could, and it's not just thump the table and, you know, repeat the mission. It's an honest dialogue. And, and the point of that is to get away from these violations. The more that people focus on the last violation that happened, the last norm that was breached, the more it will create this vicious feedback cycle that will just spiral it um, out of control. So there's a whole host of collaboration tools, but I wanted to show this accidental adversaries because I see it and I hear it in all sorts of companies coming up. And it's broadly speaking between um, the managers that are trying to manage work, remote workforces where they've never had to do it before and the, um, the employees that are finding the benefits of remote work environments. But what's interesting is that it's not just limited to this particular situation. Um, one of the benefits of structured systems thinking is that these system patterns are ubiquitous. So the accidental adversaries system archetype, all you have to do is change those names, those words on the loops, but the structure of that system stays the same. I was working with the Marine Corps last year and we had clearly, you have a civilian population, civilian government employees, and you have a green suitor population of Marines and you know, active duty military. They have two different cultures, very different cultures. You have a Marine culture and you have a government civilian employee. They have different lives. The Marines are Marines. The government employees are employees. They have how they view the workday, how they view mission essential. And what was happening is these two groups were inadvertently violating each other's social norms. The Marines were focused on missions. So it doesn't matter if it's eight o'clock or nine o'clock at night, I'm calling you, something's gonna happen because they're used to a 24 seven environment where you can order someone to do something uh, but civilian workers are like, hey, it was five o'clock, right? My day's over. You're interrupting my evening. That's one violation of the norm. But another violation of the norm is the civilians are used to building capabilities. You know, they're like, if you have a complex ask you need, we need to build the capability. Whereas Marines are like, we're just going to get it done. We're going to get it fixed. We're going to adapt and overcome. And so the Marines were asking for things that the civilians didn't have capabilities to do. And the civilians are saying, we need to build those capabilities. The Marines heard, well, you just don't want to do it. And what happened is the loop dominance shifted from the aspirational partnership to the vicious adversarial. And we were in a workshop when we were describing this, I drew it on the board and a Marine stood up and started knife handing the air and he goes, that's what I live. That's my life every day. That's what I experience every day. The, and this leads to the third power of the system archetypes and why I want to use them, right? The first one is to understand a system. The second is to help navigate out. But the third is to create a sort of name, a vocabulary, a grammar, a syntax, a way of describing situations we all experience every day that are complex, they're dynamic, but we, we recognize them when we see them because what happened is within a week, everyone in the Marine Corps in that area, at least that command, was talking about um, accidental adversaries. They bring it up in meeting. Are like, are we getting in an accidental adversary situation or which loop are we in? And it's kind of funny because it's new and they're making jokes, but they would recognize the complex dynamics they were in. And that's the key of using some of these tools is to recognize when these things occur so that you can identify and navigate your way out of it. Once you, and, and there's tons of research on all of these, um, these system archetypes. So once you know what you're in, there's tons of research of how to work your way out. And there's probably only 18 to 25 archetypes in, in some ways, you know, and, and we'll get into this in later. You can think of archetypes as like, atoms. There's a periodic table. There's a finite nut way you can organize these loops. And as you get more complex, you can create infinite complexity like atoms can combine to molecules, but there's only 18 basic structures that you need to worry about. Um, and we will go through them on, on this as I bring them up. Like next week, we're talking about doing the attractiveness principle, which is a known archetype. Once you know the archetypes, you can begin combining them in different ways to really represent very complex systems. There's one I did, which was an accidental adversaries of um, two different schools of thought that led to what's called a fixes that fail, which I won't get into, but it's, it's an archetype about problem solving and, and doing problem solving that appears to fix the problem, but only sort of pushes it down the road. 
And the fixes that fail led to a success to the successful that described burnout. And what that meant is success to the successful in that way meant uh, sort of succeeding people who felt that they were doing well, got more resources, more attention, more support. People who didn't would get burned out and then they would tune out. And all three of these were connected. Um, and that, I mean, you can become very complex very quickly, but I also wanted to show at first here, the simple accidental adversaries by itself or fixes that fail by itself is very, very powerful. So I'll pause here, um, see if there's any questions. This is what we're gonna go over when I do these structured systems thinking, I'll pick an archetype or two. I'll talk about some of the concepts and tools in systems thinking that how you look at structured systems thinking, how you frame those problems and how you focus on problem solving. Um, let me see. Yeah, Jennifer's saying I have an um, amazing modeling tool. Yeah, it's, it's been around. If you've ever read the fifth discipline or heard of that, Peter Senge, that's where they're introduced. And the system dynamics field has been around for 30 years, but they're not well known. Um, yeah, and if management can be honest about what's happening, the virtuous green and vicious red loops, more solution tools can open up. Managers that only focus on trying to force more of the green loops while blatantly ignoring red vicious loops or only focus on hammering negative issues without strength. So that's a really good insight. So part of the use of these tools, these models, is to make what's invisible explicit, right? There's no, you can't walk through a building and, and, and follow a green, green loop on the floor. You know, you don't see a red loop connecting people. Maybe if you were in a computer game, that would be interesting. But, you know, in reality, these things are invisible. So the point of these models is to make what's invisible explicit and give it a term that we can discuss. And, and, and you had a really good insight there, Jennifer, that um, you often have, because these loops are constantly going on, you could have the problem where everyone's like, everything's fine here. We're just a, all partnership and innovation good. And they're ignoring that building problem. And again, you, you know, the definition of a threshold effect is when you have a system that has a, a switch of loop dominance and you can be accumulating those red loops, but the green loop is still dominant, but you're accumulating until you hit a threshold point and then the system switches and the loop dominance switches from the green to the red and all of a sudden you have this nasty cascade effect that you're like, where did that come from? Well, that's the challenge of complex systems. When they hit those pivot points and threshold points, they can switch fast. Um, so this is, kind of what we're thinking about talking about um, in upcoming weeks. So let's see here. This is what we're previewing for coming up and I'll, I'll walk through it here. So let me know in the comments what you'd like to see of this or if you have any questions related to complex systems that relate to business and I can throw them in future episodes of this. Um, obviously the first one, we've been doing a lot of this uh, in my consulting for like black swans. It's a, it's a term that comes from um, uh, the financial collapse. Nassim Tlaib uh, identified a black swan as a statistically rare or unpredictable event that, yeah, I mean, yeah, we knew pandemics were possible, that when it arrives, caused catastrophic results. And so a lot of questions around the COVID-19 black swan, how does that create turbulence? Uh, how long will that turbulence last from a business perspective? We can go over that. Um, boundary analysis on reopening uncertainty. So again, we talk about these problems. One of the big problems of a, of a quandary, a, a, a red problem, is the ambiguity. And when we talk about reopening scenarios, and when I asked this on Facebook, I got it from church leaders, I got it from school leaders, I got it from business leaders. How do you deal with this uncertainty of when and how we'll be able to reopen? Boundary analysis is a tool that can help scope that problem and, and help clarify that what is bewildering ambiguity into different chunks. So we may go over that. Um, this, this, this tug and pull between forecasting and scheduling business models versus sensing and adapting, which is more appropriate for turbulent times. I would say that most businesses, um, with the exception maybe in some high tech ones, are traditionally forecasting and scheduling. Um, versus sensing and adapting. The problem is turbulence, right? Yeah. Forecasting and scheduling is good if you're, you know, it's calm waters, steady breeze, and just aim aim east and we'll sail till we hit the horizon, right? That's forecasting and scheduling. We'll get there in about two weeks. It'll be pretty easy. When you're in a storm, you know, it's like, which way is the wind coming from right now? What's that next wave? Are the, you know, did that sail just come loose? It's sensing and adapting and talking about the business models, the two styles of business models, how they can respond. There's also this concept of anti-fragility versus resilience. These are kind of technical sounding terms, but they are 
um, they come from the complexity science that I study and they look at how do you build organizations to withstand turbulence? They are not the same thing. Anti-fragile is different than resilient. They have different traits and um, attributes and they react differently to turbulence. Um, the four problem types I mentioned today, we went through the problem colors. The four problem types deal with uh, identifying the behavioral and dynamic complexity of the problem. And if you ever hear me talk about wicked messes or tame problems or messy problems, those simple problems, the four types are simple, tame, messy, and wicked mess, right? So these are types of problems that have very specific traits you can identify that guide you when you're doing this problem solving of what tool should I use? What kind of problem is in front of me? If you know the color of the problem and the type of the problem, it's almost a, a menu of how to pick the right problem solving tools to work on it. And uh, I'll also go over the attractiveness principle system pattern. This is another system archetype. Um, where this comes in, this particular one uh, deals with how uh, when you have two relatively, two choices that are in front of you, both of which may have their attractive uh, traits, but choosing one eliminates the opportunity to do the other. And the archetype is about how you balance that. So this comes to the head in COVID-19 when we talk about reconfiguring supply chains, right? How do you reconfigure supply chains? How do you redo your contracting agreements? How do you redo your, your, your work, workspace design? All of these come down to this concept of an attractiveness principle where you're choosing between different choices, but the choice to make one makes it unable to do the other. So we'll look at the dynamics of that and how that plays out. But um, so that's, that's all I had for today. Wanted to keep it simple from the beginning. Um, hopefully everyone uh, enjoyed it. Again, I'll put this up on YouTube. I'll splice it up and throw links up on YouTube and LinkedIn. And again, this is going to be a little bit different than the InfoMullet. It's, it's less focusing on, you know, the, the current events context, but really digging in deep to businesses organizations, and uh, how you can use structured systems thinking and other problem-solving tools in uh, turbulent environments. So uh, that's all for today. Hope everyone stays well and uh, leave any comments you have or questions you have, and I'll, I'll try and get it to next week. So thanks a lot and have a great day. Bye. Appreciate your time today. If you have any questions on structured systems thinking, have a problem you'd like our help on, or want to know more about developing your own capabilities in systems thinking, please reach out at the email below. We'd love to hear from you. If you're interested in what we do and want to follow our journey, I've added our LinkedIn and Twitter information. And we plan to regularly update this channel with quick tips and case studies to help you get the most out of your systems thinking and lean efforts. If you want to be notified whenever we add new video content, please consider subscribing to this channel by clicking on the red subscribe button below this video.